Now, home is a lot of work. Just plain work. When work at home is planned and organized for cooperation, there can usually be more time for leisure. I'm certainly in favor of those things. Leisure, fun. Who is it? Wouldn't we all be happier if we worked out a little system for living together in harmony? But how can we manage them? We'll have to work out the full answer together. Say, Mom, it's well. Most family problems can be solved through frank and friendly discussion, which points the way to a happy family life. You know, this is beginning to be quite a family project. It certainly is. Anyone else family function like that? That looks like a nice, a nice picture over there. Ryan, can you reach? Let's go. Whoa! Come on. We're in a whole nother level. There we go. Give Ryan a round of applause. Someone else's pen. So good. Well, I don't know if your family looks like that. My family doesn't look like that. Didn't look like that this morning getting to church either, where everyone's just like, oh, well, this is, Mom, you're swell. <laughs> like, can I just tell you what happened? Like, this is what my family, Zach was busy Dutch ovening <laughs> Isabel this morning. He's like, Dad. He runs to me, Dad. He's like so excited. I thought he was going to talk about the rugby again. We went to the rugby yesterday, and he was just going mad. He woke up, and he had that, like, DHL yellow thing. He slept with it last night. Like, I thought he was going to tell me more about rugby. He said, Dad, I did my first Dutch oven. I'm like, God bless you. <laughs> Isabel's like, <laughs> I'm like, anyway. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, who taught Zach the Dutch oven? That was his mother. It's cold in winter. <laughs> um, come on somebody aren't you glad you came to church today I'm so glad seriously I'm so glad I came to church today I feel really blessed to be in worship I feel really blessed to sing up his praises like our God is good he's a loving father he's kind he's gracious he's patient anyone else thank God that he's patient he's so patient he's been patient with me the patient child I'm his patient child um but we're starting a brand new series, and, and what we're believing for in the month of May is that even as we had ladies' night last month, ladies, was that awesome? That was next level. Uh, even as we got men's night coming up on Wednesday, come on, Iron Man, another level. Can you feel that? Just the baritone come up there. It's nice. It's the Holy Spirit as well, the baritone, anyway. Uh, and even as we got Holiday Club coming up at the end of the month, and we start a brand new series on families, teaching on how to build a family that lasts, our imperfect family. Listen, if your family is perfect, you might not get a lot from the series. <laughs> but if you, like me, have some crazy, anyone got some crazy? If you do, just look forward. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'm really believing, like we're believing that in the month of June, like there was May, and then you had something encounter the Word of God in June, and you step into a brand new chapter in July. I'm believing in the month of June, entire families will be changed. That's why we did a ladies' night. We're doing a men's night. We're teaching on family as corporately as the church, and then we're touching our next generation through Holiday Club. We're believing entire homes will be changed and restored for Jesus, for His glory. And so uh, we start you actually on the first week. Well done for making week one. You don't want to miss a single week. Seriously, each week builds on the next, and each week is a part of the puzzle that's going to help you build a family that lost. If you're a single person or a young person, I want to let you know, it's actually, don't, have you ever had the time, I wish I knew earlier? Like anyone else, like, I wish I'd known this before that. I promise you, this is the time for you to lean in and get some tools in your bag that's going to help you build. Because I promise you, it's, it's easier, it's way better to, to uh, equip than repair. And so we want to equip some people. So we have a theme scripture that we're going to read each week, uh, each one, each one. Have you, do you just find yourself saying that sometimes? Like even like each week we don't, each week, each one, each one. And, or someone says, don't forget. And you say each week, anyone else? No one else. It just comes out like me. Um, but each week we're going to read the scripture before we receive the rest of the word for the day. So we don't usually do this, but um, we're going to talk about value systems today. We're going to talk about installing a new value system. We're going to talk about removing an old value system. We're going to talk about not just fruit. We're going to talk about roots. We're going to talk about breaking cycles of habits. And because we inherit things, patterns of thoughts, we're going to move into new things. But uh, we also want to put honor where honor is due. And I want to put a lot of honor on God's word. You know, the Bible says that God's word is a living and alive. It's active. So you aren't receiving something 
stagnant today. As you receive it by faith, it's actually working in you as you're receiving it. So the Word of God is alive outside of us because it's filled with the Spirit. But it comes alive inside of us when we're filled with faith. And so what I want us to do is for these next three weeks, I don't know if we can do it going forward, but for these next three weeks, we're going to read the Scripture and uh, we're going to receive it by faith. And now I'm going to pray for your families as we receive His Word. Is that cool? So I want us to stand to our feet in honor of the reading of God's Word. We don't usually do this, so if this is your first time, it seems a bit weird. Come back next week. We're going to do it for two more weeks. Might seem more weird. Maybe you'll get used to it. And maybe in July we'll carry on. I don't know. But I really want you to receive this, not with your ears. I want you to receive this in your heart. Like, God, this month, something is going to shift for me and my family. Something is going to shift for the next generation, but it starts with me right now. It says in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, it says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves. Everyone has to choose for themselves. This day, whom you will serve, we all serve something. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We're going to read that scripture once a week for three weeks. I want to encourage you to meditate on it midweek. I want you to declare it by faith. You're like, this does not look like, our family does not look like they're serving the Lord right now. No, no, no. We're going to stand in the gap. We're going to lead our families. We are going to be the people. We're going to be the Josephs that when our brothers come to us and it's, it's just broken, God would have kept us that we can bless them. We're going to lead our families and we're going to trust God by faith. That for me and my house, it might look like the furthest thing from reality right now. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Bible says, choose for yourself today. This day, whom will you serve? And as we pray, I want you to make a decision in your heart right now. Who are you going to serve? Who's your house going to serve? Every house has a leader. Every person has a leader. We will worship something. Choose who you will worship today. Can you sense the presence of God in this house? Seriously, on this, on this series, I believe there's anointing. I've been looking forward to this series for months because I could see that. I, I can already see the byproduct of the series. I, I could see it already. I've been dying for this series. Seriously, ask the team. I'm, it's coming. It's coming. Because seriously, I'm, I'm believing with you. Not just for you, with you. I'm believing for my parts, my family. God's going to redeem, restore, build up, make strong. I need this prayer. So come on, let's pray together today. Jesus, we thank you that you, Lord, you are for families. You are for our families. Maybe pray this prayer. You are for my family. You need to say that in your, maybe you need to remind yourself, you are for my family. You are for my family. You're not against it. God, I thank you that you created family, that you are the author of family, that you are the sustainer of family. You're the blesser of family. You're the leader of family. And God, we're a spiritual family here today, but we also stand in the gap for our physical families, our homes, our brothers and sisters, our aunts and uncles, our moms and dads, God, our extended family. We stand in the gap today, and we decide for ourselves that today we will choose to serve the Lord, that we will, our house will serve the King. When the world serves something else or someone else, God, we will stand. When the, when the, social, when the social climate is, looks like a landscape, landscape God, we're going to stand, landslide. God, we're going to stand in the gap. We're going to say, I'm choosing for myself today that I will serve God. He is my leader. God, I'll just lift up every family right now that feels like they're too broken to be whole. Feels like they're too hurt to be healed. Feels like there's too much past and not enough future. That's not the case when you step in the room. When Jesus is in the house, listen to me, when Jesus is in the boat, you're not going down. No matter how much past you have, no matter how it looks so broken, looks so damaged, when Jesus steps into your boat, when you invite Him into your ship, and in a couple moments' time, I'm going to give you opportunity, if you haven't taken it already, to make Him Savior and Lord of your life. But when Jesus is in your house, you're not going down. He's rebuilding. He's restoring. He's realigning. You're recalibrating. 
Lord, I believe your presence is here. We receive your word by faith. Help us apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. So good. Turn to your neighbor and say, this sermon is for you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you need this sermon. You need the sermon. Amen. Okay, well, some of you said that with a bit more venom than I intended. <laughs> you need the sermon. Yay. <laughs> some of you said Afrikaans. That's a bit more aggressive. And you're not even Afrikaans. I know some of you are English. <laughs> you say, yay. <laughs> anyway, well, uh, it is my privilege to be serving you today. My name's Dino. For those of you who haven't met, along with my wife, Kelly, it's our privilege to serve and lead this church. And uh, you are welcome in this house. I want to say there's a seat at our table. And uh, church is better because you're in it, and you're the reason why we do it, and we're better together. And so well done for making it to church today in the midst of a crazy, it was like 30 degrees on Wednesday, and now it's like, hey, well done, Cape Town. <laughs> Keep them guessing. Um, like, I never know when to do washing, let's be honest, hey? Anyone? No one else? Like, I'm going to put it in, I'm gonna, I'm, I don't know if I, turn, if I turn it on, I have to hang it up. Like, that's just my own thing. But Webster's Dictionary, stop getting distracted. Webster's Dictionary describes a family defined as this. It says, a group of people consisting of two parents and children living together as a unit. It's basically two parents and children living together as a unit. Now, you get biological family, and uh, in most cases, uh, the mom and dad aren't biologically related. Some other cases, they are. That's, <laughs> that's just... Anyway, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Deep South. I'm joking, joking, joking. So that's, so that's one aspect. But then if you have children, then the biology comes into the house. Then it's an extension of yourself. But I want to help you understand that if you're going to renovate your home, you need to understand its construction. If you're going to renovate our families, we need to understand how it's constructed. Now, in Christian marriage, and I do want to define this, there's a difference between marriage and Christian marriage. Marriage used to mean Christian marriage, but Christian marriage no longer just means marriage. Marriage doesn't mean Christian marriage. I want to say Christian marriage is different from other marriage. The world can define marriage however the world wants to define the uh, marriage, and that's, comp guys, you can't, I think, I just want to speak to some people, we can't give them the standard before they've received the Savior. So if they define marriage as something else, that's okay, for, that's fine, because they don't know the teacher, they don't know the Savior. That's okay. But for us, if we are followers of Christ, we believe in Christian marriage. Now, Christian marriage is not just a relational promise, it's a spiritual covenant. It's where two people come together, and they're not only making a promise to one another, they're asking God's blessing as a spiritual covenant to see two become one. That's Christian marriage. Now, now that's the one aspect of the home. It's actually a spiritual covenant. And then if you have children, then the biological, you've extended. So you both have the physical and you have the spiritual. That's why you can't only lead your home by taking care of food on the table. You can't just leave the physical, you must leave the spiritual if you're in Christian marriage. We need to lead our homes towards a spiritual place. Now, that's our homes where we live, but I want to say that we're also part of a spiritual home where we belong. When you give your heart to God, that is when you receive Jesus as your Lord, Savior, and King, you become part of a universal family. That's all believers everywhere at every time. So not just the believers that are alive right now, you join the family of all believers who have ever called on the name of Jesus. How awesome is that? You join a big, big family. You thought when you got married, you joined that big family. You're like, wow, I didn't know you had 17 cousins. Now they're invited to the wedding. Like, you haven't seen the wedding. Anyone else? You've got to be ruthless. You've got to cut that list down. I'm just saying for anyone preparing for it, just cut it to the bone. You haven't seen Um Khuruk in five years? He's not coming. <laughs> and Nessie brings a nice gift. Amen. Anyway, um, just tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> anyway, I just laughed at that. But I want to say, you join a universal family, a big, 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 big family. But God, in His wisdom, said it's not good enough just to be part of the universal family. You actually created a home called the local church. So when you get saved, you need a local church. You're like, yeah, but I don't need the church to be a Christian. Yeah, well, technically, you don't need to come home to, stay, to be married. But the more you stay away, the weaker the connection. It's probably just going to be a legislation that keeps you together. Anyone else? I want to say that's why we're part of the universal family, but you also need to come home to a local place. And uh, for most of us, this is our spiritual home, like View Church, Tigerberg Hills. This is our spiritual family. We're young, but we're strong. We're only four years young, and, but God's done incredible things in just four years. It's been, it's been insane to see the growth and life change. It's been amazing. And if you're not part of our family yet, we want to say that there is a seat at our table. 
And, and the front door to our church is called Growth Track. It happens at some time in the month. The 3rd and the 10th of July, it's happening. The first two weeks of the month. Um, and we'd love you to discover more about your gifting. Discover about your destiny. We're passionate about Growth Track because we're passionate about you. So you join this universal family, but you also need to join a spiritual local family. That the home for a Christian, Christian marriage, is not just physical, it's spiritual too. And so today, I want to help you build a home that lasts. Anyone else want to have a home that lasts? A family that lasts? Anyone else? No one else? Okay, I'll take yours. Lord, I'll take their little portion over there. So I want to answer two questions. I want to attempt to answer two questions that's going to help you build a family and a home that lasts. Okay, you guys ready? The first question is, where you build your house will determine if it lasts or not. Where you build your house. Okay, so let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 7. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, you may have heard the scripture before, hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did, can we just say those last couple of words together, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain descended and the flames come, and the flames come, I just added flames, sure, escalating. It's Cape Town, you never know, there could be flames in here. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Jesus gives us three promises here real quick. Three promises uh, that he gives us. The first promise is, uh, he promises that we'll have serious difficulties in life. <laughs> Be blessed. Church was encouraging today. Jesus promises that you will have serious difficulties in life. He didn't say if the storm comes. He says when the storm comes. He says when the storm comes. Um, someone once told me, I think it was Nick, a wise builder. He says, if you only build for summer, you won't last the winter. If you only build your house for good times, you will not last the tough times. You need to build your house on something stronger than feelings. Something stronger than emotion. Listen, stronger than good financial status. Because how many people know? Ups and downs, ups and downs. You need something stronger than things that you can find on earth. You need to build your house on the rock of God. He promises tough times. Secondly, he promises total security and success to those who build their house on the rock. He says, they will probably stand. They might possibly stand. No, he says, they will stand. They will not fall. When our life fails, that means one day when we die and you're serving Jesus, your house still stands even when you leave the earth. Did you know that? You're building your house on the rock. He says, it will not fall. God is not a man that he should lie. When Jesus says it, I believe it. And when I build my house on the rock, it will not fall. That's a promise. The third promise he gives us is that every, uh, Jesus promises that for every person that doesn't build on the rock, that builds on sand, he actually says, failure to every person and family that, that, that builds on sand. He says, every person that builds on the rock, it will not fall. And any person that builds on sand, it will fall with a great fall. It sounds hectic, eh? Hey? It's like, I almost feel like it's a swear word to say there's consequence to bad decisions. Like, <laughs> In this culture, it's like you can't tell someone, if you put your hand in the fire, you're going to burn. How dare you speak that over my life? No. Just don't put your hand in the fire. Like, you're going to burn. It's like a consequence. Like, don't put your hand in the fire. If, if you jump off the roof, you're probably going to snap an ankle. Like, just don't do it. Like, don't tease the dog with your face so close. Pro Anyone else? No, I didn't listen to that one. I was like, yo, yo. you're going to get burnt. Guys, if you play with snakes, that guy, have you seen those ones? He's like, ah. why would you, the isinyoka, like just leave the isinyoka in the box. Just don't, don't try, you know, he tries to do the kiss on the head. Like, like, have you ever seen it? I'm like, leave the snake in the box. Guys, the Bible is clear. There's consequences to every decision you make. Listen, there's a great, God doesn't bless your ideas. He blesses his ideas. He doesn't bless your opinions. He blesses his word. He says, if you build your house on the rock, you will stand. If you don't, you're going to fall. I want my house to stand. I want my house to be strong. I want my children to be blessed. So there's three promises Jesus gives us right from the scripture. 
And so we need to ask ourselves the question, well, um, why on earth, why on earth would anyone build their house on the sand? Like if you're going to build your house on the rock, and the way that you build your house on the rock is when you apply his word. It said both heard it, but only one applied it, and that determines where your house is built. And so um, the question is like, like, why would you build your house on sand? It seems so foolish, as Jesus said. Well, the question is, uh, maybe I'll put it this way. Have you ever kicked a pile of sand? Like, just kicked a pile of sand. And uh, what gives way? Your foot to the sand. It's the sand. You ever stub your precious, your precious, precious baby tiny toe on a rock? <laughs> what gives way? Your toe or the rock? Your toe is just, <laughs> you just got a link to a sharp left, 90, <laughs> Sharp left, your toe gives away. And uh, earlier this week, um, because the weather was so crazy, um, it was a very busy week. We had a church planting intensive. We saw over 50 church planters come to the intensive. It was incredible. We're helping churches all over our nation get planted. It was just incredible. But it was a very busy week. We were out morning, evening, morning, evening. I don't know, Ingle Angle, Silver Bangle. I thought I was having breakfast at night, night at breakfast. It was just like, we, were just, we just jam-packed the week. Anyway, there was one, there was a couple hours we had a free gap. And I thought, Sure, I'm going to steal this right now. So I stole the kids from Kelly, and I went to the beach. It was about half past four, shot down to the beach. It was about 35 degrees, like in winter. It was apparently like a record. Now it was like 30. I'm preaching a bit. Get into it. Tell the truth. And uh, we get to Malkos, and it's lacquer, and we're jawling. But there's always that stage where you're like all excited and you're in the water, whatever like that. But then like, then you want to risk, man, because daddy's tired. Anyone else? This dad moment, like, like Isabel wants to play. And I'm like, a daddy a tired now. Daddy, want to go sleepies? Daddy, relax. No, 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 no. Don't jump on me. No, no. Daddy doesn't want the sand. Okay, I have to go wash it off now. Daddy, upset. Daddy, give hiding. Not in front of other people. <laughs> Put in the corner. No one else. <laughs> I'm glad I resonated. Anyway, so I, 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 I'm going to lie down a little bit. I feel a bit. I'm pretty tired. I'm going to go home. So I'm lying down in the sand anyway, and I get up off the sand, and I realize, I look down on the sand, and I see, you know what I realized? When I lay on the sand, I get up. There's like a, obviously, a raptor shape there, like right into the, but it was like a, I was like, hey. It was a towel, man. The towel wasn't, it wasn't lacquer, you know what I mean? But I saw my body shape in the sand, and I realized the reason why we build our lives in the sand, because when we build it on the sand, they take, the, sh the sand takes our shape. <laughs> But when we have to build it on the rock, we have to take its shape. And that's why everyone wants the sand over there, but no one wants the rock over here. Someone once said, someone once said this, and he said, you get two kinds of Christians. One who worships the God who created them, and the other who worships the God they created. That's the difference between building with sand and building on the rock. Now, I got, uh, no, 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 oh, I'm not allowed to, um, I shouldn't do that. Oh, this actually, this is how I should handle my finance. Oh, this is how I should treat my marriage. This is how I should treat my wife and my spouse. This is how I should raise my kids. Yes, because you are the ultimate authority. I want to build on the rock. But that means I need to change. That means I need to grow. So where you build your life will determine if your house stands or falls. Jesus says, don't be a fool. I'm inviting you right now to build it on the rock. For me, I'm going to choose for myself. Choose for yourself where you're going to build your house. Is this helping some people? So where you build it, and then I want to give you four values right now real quick. Four values on how you build it. I want to help some people today. And what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be deconstructing and reconstructing a value system in your home. But a value system in your home starts with a value system in your heart. Now, I'm not talking about behavior modification because you can cut off the fruits of an apple tree, but just wait a little while, there's going to be more apples, hey? That's, that's religion. Religion says just cut off the fruit so you don't see it on the outside, but the root's still deep on the inside. Just give it some time. They'll come back. You think, oh, no, I need to stop doing this, stop doing this, start doing this. No, no, no. Just cut off the fruit. And it looks all nice on the outside. Oh, no, it's awesome. But the roots haven't changed underground. I want to talk about redoing your value system with four key values that you need to plant and water, ongoingly water. That's why we gather. That's why we continue to gather and pray so that the roots can change, be uprooted, and something new can be birthed in your life. That's what I'm believing for your family that a value system be reinstalled in your life. Are you ready? Four values real quick. That's going to be helpful. The first value uh, that we read in God's Word, I believe is going to help you, is uh, value number one. We need to surrender your life and your family to the Lordship of Jesus 
and His Word. First value, this is not a fruit, this is a root. And I, I want to say this, I'm talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, that's okay. In a couple moments, I'm going to give you an opportunity to become one, to receive Jesus, to receive forgiveness, to be made whole and new in a moment, not because of your goodness, but because of His goodness. But I want to talk to Christians. I want to say as a Christian, you may be, you may be going to heaven, but he, is He Lord of your life on earth? When you give your heart to Jesus, this should happen simultaneously, but doesn't often happen at the same time. Sometimes it takes a renewing of the mind to get everything in alignment. My spirit, I'm a new identity, but my flesh needs to catch up. Anyone else? And when you leave church and you think, oh, I made this decision, but oh, wait, I went back to my bad habits. And the enemy says, see, you haven't changed. No, you have changed. You are a new creation. You just need to bring into alignment the flesh with the spirit. The spirit is leader now. Amen? But I want to talk to Christians. Have you surrendered the lordship of your life? to Jesus and His Word. The Lordship, the leadership of your life. Does He lead your marriage? Does He lead your home? Does Jesus lead your finance? Does Jesus lead the way that you conduct business? Does Jesus lead you in the way that you treat other people? Is Jesus the Lord, which means leader of your life? Jesus needs to be the Lord and leader of our lives. Now, a little while ago, we talked about the general will of God, you discover God's general will for your life through His written word. And you discover His specific will for your life through His spirit and through His people. You're gifting, they're healthy. That's why we're body together. And the spirit of God affirms something in your heart. Oh, maybe I'm supposed to be doing that. God's calling me to this. I feel stirred for legacy. I feel stirred for justice. I feel stirred for kids. I feel stirred for production. I feel stirred in this. Okay, the Holy Spirit's talking to me. But the general will is found in His word. But the specific will is found through His spirit. And so we first need to get the general will ticked off before we can trust Him for the specific will. Does that make sense? The general will is that He's Lord and His Word has the final authority in our lives. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. We're going New King James Version, so you know this is good. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of all of us. See, the, the original sin wasn't that Adam and Eve hated God's way. They just turned their own way. Now, I want to say when we turn our own way, there's only one destination, and that's the fall. But when we say, I'm choosing your way above my own preference, we start to build a house on the rock. The first value that I want to encourage you to apply to your life is surrendering the lordship of your life to Jesus and his word. And you have to find out what the word says for you to do that. The second value, are you with me today? The second value is that we need to trust God as your heavenly Father to meet your needs and care for you. The second value system that you need to have in your home, I believe, is that you need to trust God as a loving heavenly Father that He cares and loves for you and will meet your needs. Now, um, you inherit things as you raise your house. The way that you were raised or the family that you come from. Now, when we get saved, we come under another kingdom. So sometimes we need to unlearn and relearn some things. And some of the best things I've ever learned were from my mom, front row, work ethic, um, integrity, push through, commitment, working multiple jobs, making whatever. I think it's just I learned from my mom is whatever it takes to get the job done. That's one of the great values I've learned. Um, and, and you see this, and God's word is so clear that he's a loving father. Now, my dad wasn't around. It was just me and my mom. And, and we did what it takes. And my mom was a, a dad and a mom. So she got a mother's day and a father's day. But spiteful, like father asked me. <laughs> but for Bara, like father's day, like, mm. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's father's day, right? Mom and dad. But truth be told, I have this thing that rears up sometimes. It's, it's fear of lack of provision. Anyone else? Sometimes, I'm just being honest, sometimes it rears up in me. I'm like, <gasps> like, is there going to be enough for the kids? Is there going to be enough for the, like, it's, it's, it just comes up in me sometimes. It's out of nowhere. Like, oh, there you go. It's, it's Nyoka. And I'm like, no, back in the cage. <laughs> Shake it off. And, uh, and every time, listen to me, without fail, and Kelly is a good, is a good, a good, good person. She reminds me, every time I get fearful about finance, Kelly reminds me who your father is. Every time I get fearful about, fearful about finance, she says, oh, you forgot who your dad is. 
Have you forgotten who your father is? And I'm going to be honest. That's seriously. And if I look back, every single time I've become fearful about provision, I forgot who my dad is. I forgot that he loves me. Not only does he love me, but he knows me. Like he knows we need something to eat. He knows that electricity needs to be on. He knows, he knows the number of my house. Like he knows that we need petrol in the tank. He knows that. He, it's not like, oh, I forgot. Oh, is that how it works? I don't know. Like God, omnipotent, omniscient. Is that how it works, petrol? No, no, he knows you. He loves you. The second value system I want you to put in your heart today is that God loves you and he cares for you. Psalm 23 says this. It says, um, for the Lord is my shepherd. And I like to put the word because in the beginning. I don't, I'm not used to adding like words to the Bible, but just this one time. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Look who I'm following, not myself. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not even for my own. Yea, I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, come on, you King James, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, come on, church, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. The first value system, you've got to surrender the lordship of your life to Jesus and his words. Second one, you've got to remind yourself who your father is. He loves me. He's going to take care. Don't, don't react out of fear. Sometimes so much disconnect happens in, because you, you react out of fear, actually, if you're going to be truthful. Just remember who your father is. The third value system, is this okay? Is to think about the generational effects of your life and plan accordingly. You need to think about the generational effects of your life and plan accordingly. The most basic way I can illustrate this is a budget. If you know that, come on somebody, now you're all the B word. That's worse than the other B words. Some of you are like, sure, fluke in, need a A budget. Now, if you know the debit order is coming off on the first, I tell you what, don't spend all your money on the 31st because there's something still coming. I tell you what, you live your life differently when you know there's something more coming. When you know that, as someone once said this, Woo! Oh, you guys aren't ready for this one, but anyway. It says that um, my kids will either recover from my bad decisions or receive from my good ones. My children will either have to recover from my bad decisions or they will receive from my good ones. The Bible says this in Proverbs 13, 22. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous means that God will use all things for those who are called his children. We're all his creation, but you become his children when you receive his son. It says a good man actually thinks ahead for his children's children. I want to say that when we're leading our homes, the value system we need to put as a filter through which we see life, like if you wear dark lenses, it can be really bright outside, but everything looks gray. Sometimes you need to change the filter. I'm living my life differently because there's still more to come. I'm living my, I'm actually going to be in the house of God, involved in the family of God, not only for my sake, but to model something greater for my children. Now, a value system, I know it sounds crazy, you need to put value on something for it to be a value in your life. I say it all the time, where you show your time, or where you give your time shows what's a priority to you. You have found yourself in the house of God, not by accident. So this shows God, this is a priority to you, well done. And I want to say, if you're going to re, whatever you uh, uh, celebrate, people will gravitate. So they'll gravitate towards what you celebrate. They'll repeat what's rewarded. So if I only give Zach high fives for scoring a try for the rugby field, but I don't commend him when he's reading his Bible, what am I telling him about my value system? If I'm willing to wake up at four to go to work, but I'm not willing to wake up early to go to church, what am I telling him? You'll teach what you know, but reproduce who you are. I want to reproduce champions. So I want to... This is a value system kind of thing, and the worship team can come up, because I think I'm well over my time, but that's okay. I lead this. No, I'm just, it's a boss. It gets the boss here. Get us the boss. Think about the generational effects of your life and plan accordingly. You know what's crazy? I didn't actually think about this, but I did before this point, is that if we come to church every week and we don't disciple our children at home, 
It's only four hours a month. If you come to church every single week, maybe five hours, some months, and we don't disciple our children home, that's only four hours a month that our children will hear the word of God. I also want to say this. I want to say that we do not live in a non-biblical world. We live in an anti-biblical world. The world is not indifferent to your faith. It's against it. Everything about the world is against the Christian faith. Listen, you can celebrate being any other faith, can't you? There's no repercussion. Lift up the name of Jesus. I promise you, you'll get some enemies. I wonder why. It's because we're not called to be of this world. We're called to be of heaven and bring heaven to earth. I want to say, if you're going to be different, you need to live different. We need to raise different. We need to build different. We don't build on the sand where it forms our shape. We build on the rock. We, we, we form its shape. We change, we grow, we surrender the Lordship of our lives to Jesus, we remember that we have a loving Father, we think about the next generation, and the fourth one is, keep your family, listen to me, I'm going to read this out, keep your family in a Bible-believing and preaching church where they can be grounded spiritually and build strong relationships. Now, I try to make that point a lot more succinct, I was trying to, I thought, listen, that's a, that's a sentence. I mean, that, that's, that's a sentence over there. That doesn't just roll nicely. But there's some wording in there that you need to keep because the world will take. We need to keep our family in the house of God. Keep them grounded. Keep them planted so that they can build strong relationships. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. I want my kids to have a great future. So I want them to have great friends. And so we get grounded in the house of God. Hebrews tells us, don't neglect coming together, but stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together in this manner of some, but exhorting one another so much and so much more as you see the day approaching. I want to summarize. I'm far over time. Where you build your house determines whether it's stand or fall. How you build your house will determine where it stands or fall. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Can we stand to our feet? Come on. We're going to trust God together today. I want us to pray, and then we're going to end off on a praise song because we're going to celebrate the goodness of God. Can you sense something shifting on this series? Like, I honestly feel something shifting in my heart in this series, and it's week one. Like, I'm, anticip- I'm expecting. I know what the rest of the weeks hold. We've planned. We've built the series already with the end in mind. It's not like, oh, did we arrive at here? No, no, no. I've built this series. I know where we're going to land, and I'm expectant. I'm expecting for your kids. I'm expecting for mine. I'm expecting for our church. I'm expecting for our families. And I want to say this. If you don't have faith for your family, you feel like, Jesus, it's a bit tough to get out the facts of life. We've got some faith in the room for you today. So I want to pray two prayers. First prayer I'm going to pray is I want to invite you to make that first decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Come on, if you're a Christian, like if you've already received Jesus, then I want you to start praying right now that someone in this room, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know him personally as their Lord and Savior, I want you to pray right now, wherever you're standing, I want you to pray for them. You don't need to know their name. He knows their name. You don't need to know their story. He knows their story and still loves them all the same. But I want you to pray. I want you to pray that they would respond in this moment. Lord, I thank you that you see us, you know us, you love us on our best days and on our worst. And the first step to building a home that lasts is giving you our heart. And Lord, we pray that, that Lord, we will respond to your good news, that you came, you died, you rose, you ascended, you sent the Holy Spirit down to help us get close to the heart of the Father. We pray in Jesus' name that any person that's in this room under the sound of my voice If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you need to recommit your heart to Jesus, that in this moment you would pray this prayer. You can pray this in your heart. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you love me. Let's start there. Just say, thank you, Jesus, that you love me. Thank you, Jesus, that you came for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me to wash me clean and to make me new. I confess I'm a sinner. I confess I've got it wrong. Pray this prayer. But I thank you that when you died 
and I receive you as Lord, you make me right. Today I declare, because you are my Lord, I'm a new creation. I repent. That means I turn towards you and I ask you to forgive me. Wash me clean. And I promise to worship you and serve you all the days. I want to pray for a second group of people. If you prayed that first prayer after the service, there's a wonderful team that would love to connect with you. Please don't leave without connecting with us. We're going to be in front of you. We'd love to pray with you if you gave your heart to Jesus. Second prayer, I want to pray for our families. Maybe as I was preaching, you thought, geez, I don't know. That seems like a very high hill to climb. I want to say you don't climb it alone today. Maybe you're newly married and you're thinking, that, you know what, for, if you're newly married, I'm absolutely believing God's going to give you a whole bunch. He's giving you a whole bunch of tools right now. So we're going to build a new home. And even if you feel like you need to restore some old things, God's going to give you a new, fresh strength to tackle old problems. He's going to reground your foundations. He's doing something deep in your heart. Lord, I thank you that you're rebuilding families. You're restoring homes. I pray for the moms and dads, the husbands and wives, the single parents. Lord, I pray for the young and old. I pray, Jesus, we would surrender the lordship, the leadership of our life to you. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us every step of the way. Lordship in our relationships, your lordship in our finance, your lordship in our hearts, in our minds, your lordship in the way that we treat other people. We remind ourselves that you love us, you care for us, you know us well. Thank you, Jesus, that that you've called us to raise up the next generation. And Lord, we absolutely, absolutely pray that you would help us keep our families in the house, the spiritual house of God. I pray a blessing on each house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we honor God today? Come on.